This week I'm joined once again by writer and occultist John Michael Greer. We discuss horror, the work of H.P. Lovecraft, and John's latest fiction series, The Weird of Halley, which is set in Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos. If you wish to support Omitics, please find the Patreon, merchandise, and donation links in the description below. Also, I'd like to thank all listeners, subscribers, and donators for their continual support. I wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Enjoy. Okay, so John Michael Greer, thanks uh, once again for joining us on Hermetics. Well, thank you again for having me on. Uh, and this is actually the the first ever Christmas special. It's on it's on Lovecraft and horror because I think you know that's <laughs> that's what you need at Christmas. That is the gift I, you I, need. I, I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to argue. <laughs> um, with that said, I I managed to find a connection between horror and Christmas. It isn't actually that difficult. But so there's two paths here, and I'll, I'll let you pick. Do you want to begin with Christmas, or do you want to begin with uh, Lovecraftian horror? Oh, let's begin with Christmas. The, the tentacles <laughs> can start emerging from Santa from behind Santa Claus's okay. smiling face. Okay. Um, <laughs> a little later, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so is your current uh, primary practice of occultism still still druidry? Oh yes. Okay. Um, well, it's 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 complicated, honestly, because um, that's I mean, druidry is my spirituality. That's if you if you will, my religion. Mm -hmm. um, that's the framework within which I practice. But I do a lot of different occult practices. I've studied a lot of different things, and to some extent, picked and chosen here and there. So you know, mm -hmm. um, but but I do you know I celebrate the solstices and the equinoxes and so on. That that was what I was going to ask. Um, I'm I'm mm -hmm. fairly ignorant on this question, but in terms of. Uh, uh, and a cult such as yourself, uh, what, what does Christmas kind of look like in terms of uh, traditions? Well, in terms, okay, okay, now I'm going to differentiate here between <laughs> Christmas and the solstice, okay? okay? Because the winter solstice, Alban Arthuan, as we would call it, um, you know, that's, that, that's the great festival of returning light. The sun in the northern hemisphere, the sun has slid as far south as it's going to go, and it kind of does a little hang time and then starts moving north again in the heavens to, to bring, you know, bring spring and summer with. It. So it's always a you know it's a, it's a time of returning light. It's a time it's it's a good time to have a to have a big meal and do a celebration that involves rekindling candles and things like that. Um, just one of the one of the normal um, part of the normal heartbeat of time in in the, a temperate or or, um, or subarctic region. You know that's what the solstice means to me. Now Christmas, on the other hand, is the great festival of greed. <laughs> The, you know the primary, the primary, um, the, you know one of the one of the primary driving forces of our, of our society is this de notion that you know you got to get out there and waste your money on all kinds of claptrap that you don't want and don't need, and the people you're going to give them to don't want, and don't need either. But we've got to do this to keep the economy rolling. And so I, I see, I see Christmas, December twenty fifth, as you know, as as the festival of greed presided over, um, you know, by by Santa Claus. So I suppose we're getting into Lovecraftian horror already. But you know you have the you have the jolly old figure ho ho ho. Uh, <clears throat> well, actually, we have that over here. I, I've never quite been sure whether Father Christmas still uh, clings to life over in over on your side of the pond, or if, um, um, if Santa Claus has entirely ousted him. What What's the difference between the two? Um, I I get the impression. Well, I don't know. The thing is, I've I've never actually spent a holiday season in Britain, um, so I don't know. Um, I mean, our Santa Claus is, you know, very fat and very jolly and um, mostly spends his time manufacturing uh, consumer products to, to distribute, to uh, bring down chimneys and, and leave under people's trees. I had had the notion from, you know, the, such scraps as I'd read, you know, uh, C.S. Lewis and things like this, that, that it was a little different on, on your side of the pond, but I could be wrong. I think probably it used to be, but these days I would say that I mean, just as an anecdote, I hear, when I'm walking through town, I hear young people saying, it must be Christmas, Santa Claus is on the Coca-Cola advert. So I think that, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so yeah, that, that's... That's, 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 that's really sad. I, I'm yeah, very, um, so there's, so, there's so, not much so Brit um, St. Yeah. Nicholas type. Yes, type. Britain has been conquered by Santa Claus. I, I get this, okay. Uh. <laughs> I think some, you know, some kind of Church of England schools still do um, nativity and things along those lines, but it's kind of a token gesture, I think, more than mm -hmm. a sincere uh, yeah. and, practice. And the, the thing is, Christmas as the celebration of the birth of, of the birth of a god, 
you know, of course, the, the one of the, that's been going on at the winter solstice for a very long time, and that seems very reasonable to me. If you know, if your religion, if if the if the day you, deity you worship was born in the flesh on Christmas Day, okay, great. That's I have no objection to that. Um, I get kind of tired of of Santa Claus pushing uh, consumer goods on people, but that's just me. Okay, um, but but the you know we already we already just touching horror there uh which you, you kind of <laughs> i don't know uh which you actually already already said which is one of the questions i have here is we, we see uh masses of people gathering under certain symbols which we've just mentioned you know we could even say uh, mm. the color red the uh the, mm-hmm. the santa claus hat uh lights the the, the trees um so symbols that they don't take seriously um, and they, mm-hmm. they gather under these unconsciously, in a way, to, uh, mm-hmm. to purchase other symbols of uh, affluence, popularity, status, etc. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And so, what do you think this form... Because I, I would say that the unconscious force that's driving all these people to do so is a kind of form of horror, in a way. Um, what If you see it that way, what form like, do you think... I, I, do you I see like, that I like as a that. horror? I like that, yeah. No, that 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 makes a, that makes a great deal of sense. Um, I had been thinking primarily um, of it not so much as as horror, but as simple manipulation, the kind of extreme, the debased magic of advertising, as Joan Codiano pointed out quite some years ago. You know, when when the the advertisements on the television are convincing you that you're drinking this fizzy brown sugar water or what have you is going to make you popular and happy, and they, that's that's sorcery. These people are under a curse. That makes them think they're running out to, to you know to Tesco or what have you to buy you know to buy X product is going to make them happy and fulfilled and make all the members of their preferred gender tumble all over them or what have you, and we all know it's not so, but people act as though it is. So I suppose that's one dimension of the horror: the horror of people laboring under this this sorcery of advertising that convinces them that they're actually they actually need or want all this crap that they don't need and they don't want. But you're right that there's a deeper horror to it. Mm-hmm. But this was the... Uh, and I'm just going to put another little thing in there because uh, Kuliana is is a name which I believe needs to work. Eros and uh, Magic in the Renaissance is an, an the absolutely one. sublime text. I haven't read mm-hmm. his other text on... Um, kind of oddities and strange happenings but mm-hmm. brilliant commentary and I, you know not not no, so well known now yeah but all of his stuff is worth reading all of his stuff is seriously worth reading um you know if you if you if you put, put some put a book by you on Coliano under your under your christmas tree <laughs> you'll you, you won't regret it um okay. but but yeah i mean there there is there there is that there is there is that deeper horror. I mean, on the one hand, I don't know. Again, I don't know if this picked up at all over um, over on your side of the pond. But you're starting to see a return of interest on this side in the spookier end of the Christmas of, of the Christmas holiday, and the figure of Krampus, who is a sort of devil figure, horned and hooved and hairy, mostly found in Central Europe up until now. But he's starting to to pick up some kind of um, some kind of popularity in various parts of the United States. Um, um, there was a there was a fantasy novel, um, Krampus the Yule Ward by Braun. Um, there was there have been various other things. Just, just dealing with the fact that maybe there's something a little a little more real, a little more spooky, a little more a little more interesting mm-hmm. going on behind all of this. You know, the, this this prancing around and ho ho ho. Yeah, there's been um there was a couple of Krampus films, but I haven't kind of had the, had the time nor nor the patience to really watch mm-hmm. them. But th- there is actually one other thing which I don't know if I'm not sure if this originated in America. It wouldn't surprise me if it did. No offense to you guys, but have mm-hmm. have you are you aware of Elf on a Shelf? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And yes, so, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure the the elf on a shelf thing did in fact that that's the kind of the kind of awful um, you know sub Lovecraftian horror that that does indeed come out of the American consumer economy. Um, mm. And no, no offense taken. Trust me. I, I I I know what we've unleashed upon the world. Yeah, <laughs> uh, a, a, a festive panopticon, which is kind of central. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but with regards to this kind of this this Christmas force, which kind of grabs consumers and 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 just throws them into this kind of tumult of just like not just plain not thinking. I was recently reading um, 
Dion Fortune's uh, Psychic mm-hmm. Self-Defense, the classic mm-hmm. text, which mm-hmm. has made many people think they're under attack, but it's also a great text. And it made me think, is this, is Christmas time, as it's kind of known within within modernity, a, a sort of strange form of, of attack, but we can't really pinpoint the, the aggressor? I think, well, I think we, we can, there, there's a lot of aggressors, of course, <laughs> but um, starting with the, with the department stores, um, I mean, your your high street is is lined with aggressors casting, casting diabolical spells on people to try to to make them to make them waste their money. Um, so you've got that. You've got the whole industry that's built up around that to try to get people in in a warm, festive mood so they won't think too hard about what they're doing. And you know, I'm sure there are various other. Uh, as with as with almost anything like this, it, it's it's really rather like. Um, Oh, a situation on the African on the African savanna. Let's say a lion, um, you know, leaps out of hiding and brings down um, a water buffalo. Okay, and as soon as the water buffalo hits the ground, uh, creatures are coming from from every direction to try to get a piece of the meat. You have the vultures swooping in. You have the jackals and the hyenas trotting over, hoping to hoping to, to be able to stick their muzzles in. And I, I think that that's a lot of what's going on with with Christmas these days. You know, with the consumer as the water buffalo. Um, the the industry, the, the retail industry, as the lion, and you have all these various other vultures and jackals and hyenas um, trotting around trying to sink their teeth into the consumer's flesh while they have a ch- while well, he's down. <laughs> do, you, do you think this we can we can find within any any of this the original original kind of spirit or tradition, or is is, is it just gone? Oh, well, the thing is, I think it's I think it's always possible. Is um, want to back, go back behind all of the crap, all of the consumer nonsense, all of the ting 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 jingle bells and this sort of nonsense, <laughs> and you've got the reaction of people in in in, in a temperate or, or subarctic climate to winter. You know, you have the sun's the sun is lower and lower in the sky with each day that passes. It's getting cold. It's getting dark. The harvest is in, and you know this is how much food you have until the next harvest is in. If it runs short, you starve. Um, it's it's a time of harsh realities, and then just when you think the sun's finally going to finish going all the way into the south and never be seen again, leaving the world in darkness and cold forever, um, it starts coming north again. And right at that moment of turn, it's, it's a great time to just recognize the, our dependence on the natural, on the, the natural cycle of things, um, our dependence on the plants and animals that, you know, the, that we feed on, that we, that we take care of, and so on, our dependence on, 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 on nature. And it's a very good, it's, it's there. You know, we, we may shield it behind all of these layers of, of business and industry and so on to try to detach ourselves from the simple reality that um, whether we get to eat depends on, on the harvest and depends on, on what happens with the weather and what happens with the laborers and, and so on and so forth. If instead we own up to that, we accept that we, in fact, revel in it, then we become a little more real, a little less plastic. And, and that's one of, the things that, uh, one of the things that I think drives people toward celebrating the solstice and um, walking away from all of the ching, 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 ho, ho, ho business. And, of course, there's also the, 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 not, not the, the non-minor point that if you celebrate the solstice, you get your presents four days early. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Druids have huge advantages here, you see. Um, oh, yeah, where do, do I sign up? I'll sign up for both. Okay, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, exactly. But, but yeah, no, the thing is there, is, there is this reality, and, and it's something that can be symbolized, and that can be expressed, and that can also take the shape of, you know, the rebirth of a solar deity, who basically is what, what Christ is, and, and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's all very appropriate, and it's not that hard to get back to. You just have to um, turn off the television, or better yet, throw it in the dumpster. Mm-hmm. Um, and, pay, you know, pay attention to what's actually going on in the world. Which is, it's kind of obvious that, that modernity is overtaken, because... I guess that has uh, suffocated the reality so much, especially for, um, 
I'm almost always speaking always of the West because that's my frame mm-hmm. of reference. But you know, we mm-hmm. we, we have um, veg, veg and fruits all year round, which are out of season for you know nine mm-hmm. nine months of the year. So it does seem like such a thing as the solstice or, or light returning out of the darkness mm-hmm. isn't even a thing anymore because we've mm-hmm. got this uh, what what all of would call you know the demiurge of technology has kind of yeah. taken yeah. over. Yeah, we we have we have we've we've built this immense. This immense hallucination, basically, made a hallucination made concrete to try to pretend to ourselves that that no, no, we're not dependent on nature. We don't. None of this matters to us. We are man, the conqueror of nature. We don't have to care, and, and yet we do. But you know, just at the moment, by wasting fantastic amounts of fossil fuels and flooding the skies with carbon dioxide and various other useful things like that, um, we can produce the the temporary illusion. Of, of being detached, of being separate, of being able to get whatever we want. We've, I mean, we, we've basically, it's as though we read all these fairy tales and decided to make them happen. Do you recall, the, the, I forget which fairy tale it is now, but where, you know, the, 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 the poor orphan girl is sent out by the wicked stepmother um, in, in December and told to come back with a flat of strawberries. And, you know, and nowadays, again, she just go down to the local, the local grocery store. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's it's very much this attempt to this a sort of a sort of the behavior of overgrown infants trying to trying to make believe that the world is what it is what it is in fairy tales. What you just said there brings me to one of very strangely actually, almost spookily so brings me to one of the later questions, which is which is kind of to do with Lovecraft and to do now with Christmas and technology and everything, and it's to do with this term uh, that was developed in the nineties called hyperstition. I don't know if you've you've heard of it or come across it. I'm so, I'm sorry. What was the term again? Um, hyperstition. So it's a a, a connection of uh, superstition and hyper so it it basically means uh Mm -hmm. the way in which uh fictions uh turn into a reality by kind of uh Hmm. shall we say parasitically invading the culture so much so for instance a very clunky example but a very very clear Mm -hmm. one is back in uh 2000 and let's say eight if someone said trump is going to be president that's completely a fiction um, mm-hmm. But then, 4chan gets a hold of a hold of everything, and you know it tumbles into culture and in w- such a way. And that, away we go. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I had not encountered that that term, and thank you for it because the hyperstition that works. <laughs> I can see some ser- I can see some serious uses for that concept. Yeah. So especially, so I, I imagine you're already kind of realizing with with someone uh, such as Lovecraft, his, his books are littered with kind of so many references mm-hmm. that you start to look at them, you go, that one's not real, that one's not real, oh, hang on, that one's real. <laughs> and then you get, you get lost in a, a kind of strange, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, the, 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 world start, the, the world is a bit of a feedback loop. And what, what are the, I mean, that's one of the real powers of fiction is that, People will take these stories and get sufficiently into them that they start unintentionally acting them out. And sometimes that works really well, and sometimes it works very, very badly. But, um, but yes, it's, it's a real phenomenon, and it's, it's something that, um, especially in the more imaginative branches of fiction, people use very deliberately. Could you think of any kind of examples? Oh, um, one one of the classic examples, of course, is the use of utopian fiction as a way to get po- certain political ideas into circulation. Um, one of the writers that I've been studying very closely of, of, of late, um, William Morris, the English uh, socialist um, arts and crafts person, the guy who invented fantasy fiction as we know it, um, was also the author of, of several utopian works, one of which um, was um, News from Nowhere, which, which was obviously presented as this socialist utopia, da 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 um, and didn't actually go very far. People read it and went, wow, that's cool, and then they just shelved it. But a lot of his fantasy, a lot of his fantastic fiction, of The Well of the World's End and so on, is very much oriented toward a utopian vision, but clothed in the imagery of the Middle Ages. And from that, you can watch this notion of a sort of green medieval utopia pick up and spread throughout cult- the cultures of the English-speaking world. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, from the well of the world's end 
to the sort of green radicalism of today is a straight line. And you can, and, and if, if you're watching what, uh, what uh, Morris is doing, and he's very, in some places very explicit about it, you can watch him explaining how the sort of mechanistic socialism of his time, the idea of you're know, one big factory, um, and who cares about nature, pave the earth. Um, he's, he's, when, he's just brushing that aside, that, that movement which was so strong back in the day. He's just brushing it aside to, to re-envision a political transformation that is nature-centered, and presenting it because he presents it in fiction, it got picked up and run with first by other authors, cough cough, J.R.R. Tolkien, cough cough, <laughs> and then by then by a lot of other people. Until at this point, it's it's a phenomenon. He's literally he literally conjured it into, it into being. And so with, with the kind of evil side of this, which is mm-hmm. which is one of the things which um, happens in in your your kind of latest series, The Weird of Halley, uh, mm-hmm. which I believe the the seventh final volume is only just been published yeah it, it came out in october okay so, so to any been... uh to any listeners there'd be no spoilers um just overarching questions but in mm-hmm. uh, one of the volumes the um they are basing rituals around so the, the books are set in the uh, Cth- uh cthulhu i can never pronounce lovecraft stuff uh that's, mythos. The, whole, that's the whole point yeah it's, the, it's the, we, the we can't do it <laughs> Cthulhu is designed to look like something that cannot be cr- pronounced by a human throat because it's in a non-human language it's in the aklo language which dates from long before the origin of our species <laughs> go on <laughs> um so <laughs> Within the more, uh, we will be returning to the the evil laugh. By the way, that does make it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the within one of the the novels, the characters are kind of doing a uh, performing a ritual to uh, in within the novel. It's called Saint Toad, uh, which mm-hmm. is kind of I, I saw that's kind of tongue in cheek. I'm not too sure, but anyway, I noticed on. Your uh, on the forum that you're on the the dream with uh, Echo mm-hmm. Sophia. Some people were were talking about how this could actually become this could be something you could actually do. And and then I this is what made me think about Hyperstition because then what if you had enough people performing the ritual to mm-hmm. you know if you have enough people believing in a god in this way does the god mm-hmm. become real within culture? That's kind of the mm-hmm. the question. Oh, yeah. And and it's 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 something that happens routinely. Um, the the I mean the most obvious example um, in the Druid scene. There's a there's an American organization called the Reformed Druids of North America RDNA, and it was founded literally as a joke. Right. Um, there was a um, a college um, Episcopal you'd say Anglican same church, but basically an Episcopalian college up in um, the Midwest that had a chapel requirement. You had to go to chapel. Um, you had to go to some kind of religious service every Sunday. And this was in the early 1960s. People were stealing their oats. Young people were protesting such things. And so a group of, of, the, of the people at this college organized a bogus Druid church and started meeting on Sundays and sharing out a communion of whiskey and um, doing this little ritual. And they'd done it a few times, and then all of a sudden they started noticing they were calling to this imaginary deity, Dalon Aplandu, God of the Groves, and they were getting a response. Something was happening in response to the ritual. And it it shook some people very, very hard, but um, that's how the RDNA came into being. People started doing this ritual thinking it was just, just you know, uh, in internet speak for the wolves. But in fact, they started having religious experiences as a result of this. And the, the god of the groves that they're invoking, you know, although they had invented him out of whole cloth, um, all of a sudden they were getting something in response. So, and so, so, so this kind of thing happens. In what sense then... Do you can you differentiate between um, I guess these are these are going to be two very frustrating words, but legitimate or authentic uh, occult experiences and someone merely believing a fiction of their own kind of creation. And that well, no, the, the, this is where it gets interesting okay. because. When we're dealing with the inner side of things, we're dealing with the non-physical realm, all we have to go on is human experience. Mm -hmm. You know, we do not have a theometer 
okay, this nice crackle finish device with the, the dial and the LED reader, and go turn it on, okay, I'm getting 14.7 Jehovah's, I think we have a god here. <laughs> no, we don't have that kind of technology, okay? All we have is human experience. All we have is, you know, you do a ritual and does something happen or does something not happen? Now, there's a lot of confusion over that among people who do not do ritual and have not had the experience of something happening. If you've been there, you recognize it. And one of the reasons that occultism um, is, is a permanent presence in, in all of world societies, and that religion remains a permanent presence in all the world societies, is that things do happen. There are presences that make themselves manifest. There are um, startling events that, that take place. Um, one of the other things to, to pop back to the RDNA briefly, one of the, one of the weird things that happened that made them convince, okay, something's going on, is that a couple of people who were involved had, this was in 1963, it was in early November, and all of a sudden they had these images of the country in mourning and of a funeral, and of course later that month uh, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Mm-hmm. And so you get these precognitions. Some, in some cases, you get healings. In some cases, you get other really strange events that start happening. And, but there is that, there's that sense of presence, that sense of awareness. Now, from one point of view, if you get a result, it's, it's authentic, or at least it's valid, okay? whether or not there's a historical background to it at all. Um, you, you do have people who say, no, if you can't trace it in history, if you can't show that this comes from some allegedly more magical or spiritual time, it's not real. But, you know, how do we know? How do we know? I mean, for all we know, the gods could be sitting there going, well, that looks interesting. Yeah, I can take that name. I can take that form. Um, you know, I want to interact. These people look interesting. I want to interact with them. And all of a sudden, you've got Dalinoplandu, god of the groves. Maybe he was the Roman god Silvanus, the forest god, back in the day. We don't know. Um, what we do know is that um, sometimes rituals get results. Sometimes you invoke something and something comes in response. Now, cycling all the cycling this all the way back to um, the word of Holly Kingsport and the um, the little the little ritual morning and evening uh, to invoke the the great old one Safagua, who uh, Saint Toad was not my invention, by the way. Saint Toad was um, Robert Anton Wilson's invention. Um, he he stuck a bunch of Cthulhu and Mythos material into um, the the trilogy, the Illuminatus trilogy, his, his, the great send up of conspiracy theory um, that he and Robert Shea wrote. And but that's why I borrowed it from. So but anyway, so here we have here we have the character doing this little this little um, you know prayer and ritual to invoke the Great of One Safagwa. Now, I did not make that ritual up out of whole cloth. I actually borrowed most of it in various pieces from actual ceremonies that are used to invoke deities in some other in some traditions. And partly, you know, just as if you're describing a fight, you're describing a fist fight, okay, you've got you got two people going at each other with their with their fists, you're gonna to want to know something about how how people fight. You're gonna to want to the fight may not be identical to any fight that actually took place, but it had better be realistic. In the same way um, when I'm doing ritual in fantasy, I want the ritual to be plausible. I want it to be believable. I want it to resonate with people so they go, wow, I, okay, that makes sense. To produce that sense of, over the top word, verisimilitude. The feeling that, wow, that could be real, which is so important, especially in, in fantasy fiction, especially when you've got, you know, tentacle horrors from the dawn of time um, blorping around the landscape. You've got to do something to make, it, to make things look as plausible as possible, or people are just going to giggle. Mm-hmm. And this is the, the, the uh, extremely unique and um, uncanny aspect of uh, Lovecraft's fiction itself is that when you read it you, you he writes so well and articulately mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that you think no this this legit this happened uh, yeah exactly <laughs> Exactly. He was brilliant. Lovecraft is underrated. Lovecraft is hugely underrated. He was a much better writer than a lot of people give him credit for. Do you... One of the the impressions that I get reading Word of Halley is that... And I've always wondered this myself, so I don't know whether or not this is something you stumbled across in your research, which I'd love to hear more about, you know, what your research process mm-hmm. was like, but whether or not you believe, or if there's any data on Lovecraft actually getting involved in occultism. <laughs> 
Okay. Now, Lovecraft, H.P. Lovecraft was a rationalist atheist. He was he he thought he occasionally wished that he could be religious, just because he, he was a traditionalist. He was he was very conservative in his in his social and polit- and well for much of his life political views. But he he was he was himself. He th- there's there's a class of rationalists that you you get used to in the occult scene. People who desperately wish they could believe. Mm-hmm. And they're interested. They want to know about it. They read voraciously. They won't actually take the step of doing practices. Or if they do, they'll dabble a little bit and then back away really fast before they get any results because they're not willing to take the risk that it might actually be real. But they're fascinated by it. Lovecraft was exactly that kind of person. He read a lot of occult literature. Um, he knew his way around the literature of theosophy, for example. He cites the theosophists. And when he does, he knows what he's talking about. Um, he cites Eliphas Levy. He pulls, um, in fact, he pulls um, incantations out of Eliphas Levy for uh, the um, the case of Charles Dexter Ward. Um, he's constantly borrowing stuff from the occult, uh, from 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 occult literature of his time, and using that as raw material for his um, for, for for these these. these supernatural horror fiction Mm -hmm. and now partly i think he's doing he's doing it to get that sense of verisimilitude so you know we we all know there were occultists running around you know this is 1926 let's say okay when he's he's busy panning away um the western world was in the middle of a big occult revival there was a lot of people openly studying and practicing occultism and so lovecraft could could be kind of hinting to the readers well you know there are all these people all these strange mysterious cults that are you know doing practicing strange ceremonies and intoning weird words and what if they're actually in touch with something something with tentacles something that's out to get you and it, it, it makes for great for great horror but but he was fascinated by the stuff we have no evidence that he ever even tried to practice it and the guy wrote letters I I don't think he had a thought that he didn't write to somebody <laughs> and so I think if if he'd actually practiced I think he would have admitted it to somebody I, I mean he had he, he had um, he had friends um, I'm forgetting the name of the guy who who he co-wrote um, where the the, di- the diary of Alonzo Tiber, um, Lumley William Lumley, not to be mistaken for the, the Brian Lumley, who's later writer, but yeah, Love, Lovecraft had a friend um, who lived in upstate New York, and he co-wrote this one story with Lovecraft. And Lovecraft, in his letters to other people, going, "Yeah, Bill Lumley is a he he believes in this occult stuff." I mean, geez. So you mentioned that he's he's you know he's. Uh the culture of the time is going to be extremely kind of, um, well, all cultures, it seems, have always been very um, a, a host, somewhat hostile against kind of uh, occult things and occult mm-hmm. literature. And, um, but at the same time, it seems that culture has always been not apathetic, but hostile, but in a very, very intrigued way. Um, yeah. And we yeah. Yeah. mentioned in our in the last interview about Occultism 101 about this idea that as soon as you say occultist, people think of this caped, maniacal laugh, skulls <laughs> everywhere, yeah, yeah. super evil. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> we took the, the, the road to kind of, uh, you know, take apart this misconception. Of course, there is another route, which is to ask, why is it that you think that culture uh, uh, and the, the, the public always jump to the they're evil do you think it's because they kind of hope they are <laughs> because that's more interesting than being good let's be honest no, well, yeah you see, you see one, of, one of the problems one of the problems that we face in the western world is that we have a very a very odd notion of what good and evil are and I have to say, uh, you know, this is one of those places where you've got to put the credit and blame both on Christianity, because the, 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 Christian, the Christian religion for, you know, it has its good points, it has its bad points, like every other human creation. Um, and, but its attitude toward morality is a mess. On the one hand, you have you have this conviction, which is especially common in in Protestant countries, where if you enjoy it, it's bad. 
Okay. Anything you like is evil. And so, of course, you know, the, 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 that's the, uh, that includes the obvious things such as sex. But you'll get, you'll get these Protestant theologians who literally um, talking about how every, you know, every possible human enjoyment is a sign of sin. And so if you're, you're circulating that kind of attitude, that kind of attitude, that kind of rhetoric around people, yes, a great many people are going to say, okay, so what you're going to say is that if I, if I want to be good, I have to be miserable all the time and wallow in what a hopeless sinner I am and hope that, you know, after I'm dead, I'll actually have a good time. Okay, gotcha. Uh, this does not go over well outside of very narrow theological circles. And so, yeah, a lot of people look at the, look at the options. And especially when preachers start whipping it up and getting into the idea that somewhere out there, there are these evil people and they're having boatloads of orgiastic sex and they're feasting and getting drunk and they're putting whammies on their enemies and they're rich and they're powerful. <clears throat> yeah, you know, and 90% of the audience is going, okay, where do I find these people and how do I sign up? <laughs> And in fact, it's one of the basic rhythms of history is that anytime you have a big outbreak of hardcore um, fire and brimstone preaching about how all there's these evil people out there, you immediately thereafter have big outburst of Satanism because people are going, okay, well, that sounds a lot more fun than what I'm getting in church. So once, once again, uh, a fiction making itself. Yeah, exactly. It's, 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 yeah, hyperstition. Exactly. You know, you develop this vision of, of of evil, fun evil out there, and people go looking for it. And so, one of the things that I mean, one of the things that has been central to this all along is the notion that there that these evil people out there have strange powers. They can do stuff that you can't. And yeah, people are going to go. So where do we find out about this? Most definitely. And and so you get that the, the, the hostility toward occultism and the fascination with occultism and combine that with complete, with the near complete ignorance of occultism that is standard in in our societies and heavily helped forward by the media. And yeah, it it turns into quite a wild little brew. And um, and with that as well is always always tied to evil and I guess you could you could probably say that this does come definitely from the Christian tradition and uh, you know always on the um, occultist desk or in the occultist's house or, and it was on the the cover of um, your talk your book talks on magic and occultism mm -hmm. a, you've got to have a skull somewhere you've yeah. got to have a skull somewhere did you <laughs> did you get to choose that cover or was no no okay no. Um, I didn't argue at all because at the, you know it's one of those things people will people will generate a symbol. Mm -hmm. and then it will get picked up and run with, and this will be done, and that will be done, and pretty soon it just becomes like a brand name. And so, yeah, you know, by, by, the, by the cult paperback revolution of the 1970s, and all of a sudden you had a cult books in, in, every, in every supermarket practically, um, all you had to do was put a skull and a dagger and maybe a couple of, uh, you know, a circle with some Hebrew written in it, and everyone knew it was an occult book. And <laughs> so it's kind of the brand... <laughs> Yeah, and then of course also oh, sorry. also of course it 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 is it's a reference to um, older propaganda directing at the Freemasons and at some of the other friendly societies that used death symbolism in their rituals in one way or the other, and so you can tap into this ongoing brand name of and, and this ongoing sense there are people out there who do strange rituals and isn't that cool? But then of course with these symbols, which I guess would you would you say that? throughout their kind of continual use you know the skull and the dagger is a classic one or the the, mm -hmm. the skull with the dagger through it is a classic one throughout their continual use are these symbols then uh this sounds a bit clumsy but kind of charged um in terms of their uh their i guess power would be quite a lazy word but you know their their meaning mm -hmm. well they they certainly become um very effective releasers of emotional reactions and you can use that in, in the debased sort of uh, sorcery we call advertising. You can use it in other contexts. In fact, a lot, there are a lot of rituals out there in, you know, in, in friendly societies and in occult circles and all this kind of stuff that use a skull on a table as an emblem of death if you want to meditate on the fact that you're going to die. 
which is one of those basic realizations that everybody needs to come to in the, in the process of growing up. And it's very useful to encourage people to think about that when they're getting into a cold practice, they're taking a meditation and this kind of stuff. You want them to, to do a little growing up and to deal with the fact they're not, they, they have limited time on earth. Yeah, so you set them down in a room before the initiation ritual and there facing them is Boney the Skull, you know, Boney the Skull going, hi. You're going to croak. Um, and because it's become that big deal in pop culture, because of all those cheap, trashy super, you know, supermarket um, paperbacks with the skull and the dagger and a couple of lines of Hebrew in it, that also gets them in the mood. They're going, ooh, I'm, do, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to be initiated into a magical lodge. <laughs> and there's you know, they're only the skull smiling at them saying, yes, you are. So, yeah. Um, and so you have this interesting conversation back and forth between pop culture on the one hand and occultists on the other who are picking up stuff and using it and saying, hey, this is fun. Why don't I, you know, here's something that has been charged by all these people, you know, sort of looking at it going, whoa, and let's play games with it. Yeah, well, this is suddenly made me think of, of the kind of, uh, in the last, say, I'd say about 10 years, the absolute unfathomable increase in tattoos and the common ones are uh, these kind of symbols and I'm, I was just wondering mm -hmm. do you think there's a way that people can apply these symbols to themselves and they think these are just aesthetic kind of look this looks cool but really they are applplying a form of kind of cultural signification to themselves without yeah. kind of unconsciously without even knowing it oh yeah the, the, these days um, so many people go around with their minds packed full of the media. Um, you know, they've got the earbuds in. They're, they're, de they're detached from the world in a hallucination. Most of their lives are unconscious. Most of what they do is, you know, they're, they're busy thinking about things that aren't real and not even noticing the world around them. So they sort of go around unconsciously, and yes. Now, the tattoo thing is interesting because on the one hand, yes, you have a lot of people who are just getting, wow, that'd be cool. And then you have other people who are saying, okay, no, I, want, I, cho I choose to do this and doing it very deliberately and dealing with the pain because, you know, tattooing is not necessarily comfortable. Mm. Quite the contrary. And in a world where especially our comfortable classes are so shielded from any kind of discomfort or inconvenience, the actual experience of facing straightforward physical pain and choosing it is it's a little bit of an initiatory right. It's a, it's a saying, no, I'm actually going to step beyond the very narrow bounds that my, my society has placed on me. I'm going to do something that's going to hurt, and I'm going to do it willingly. Mm -hmm. I'm going to accept that, mm -hmm. and so yeah, I think I think that's one of that's one of the factors behind the tat the tattooing thing. It's you know the pain is at least authentic. The pain is real. It's not just something in a video game or a television show. Mm -hmm. And this this brings you around to the question that I was going towards very well, in fact, which which mm -hmm. is um, this view of death and the skulls as evil. Um, you can put them together with with death and suffering. So actually, it brings mm -hmm. everything together in a very strange way. If you have mm -hmm. Christmas consumerism, modernity on one side, which is kind of this constant uh, kind of myth of Sisyphus battle to just keep consuming, to keep, um, you know, to yep. imagine Sisyphus. Can I don't know. I don't know what, how you'd phrase that. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, just to keep consuming, just to keep ignoring the fact that there is suffering, there is death. And um, so, do you think that these things, suffering and death, are viewed as like this this kind of dark evil? Because uh, you know, they are just in complete contrast to modernity. You know, the question modernity would ask is, why would you ever want to, you know, suffer? It's like if you tell someone you're going on a meditation retreat or something, why would you ever just want to sit there? You know, that's it's mm -hmm. absurd to them. <laughs> yeah, no, very, mu very much so. Um, since the the essence of Western modernity is the is this conviction that humanity has a, either has conquered nature or is about to do so, that we can do and be whatever we want. That death, you know, death is for other people, suffering is for other people. We are the masters of creation. Um, we are the we are the meaning. We are the purpose that the universe exists. We are the summit of evolution. Blah blah. All of this delusional horseradish. Um, but that's that's modernity. That's this notion that we that. You know, the universe is dependent on us. We're not dependent on the universe. And 
death is a reminder that that's not so. Suffering, pain, reminds us that that's not so. That's why we keep, we've made death and suffering, we keep them so far away. You know, we don't, very few, very few people die in their own homes these days. You have to rush them off to a hospital. Now, partly that's, you know, in this country at least, that's partly a, pro- a matter of monetizing people's suffering. You know, you do in the hospital, then you can build the family. Um, but, you know, you rush them out of sight, out of their ordinary lives. We mustn't come in, we mustn't see somebody dying we mustn't like be there um it's we we hand it over to specialists who will you know take care of it and clean it all up and get it all pretty before we have to deal with the simple reality of human mortality Mm -hmm. and in the same way you know pain good heavens break out the drugs we can't have (laughs) that we can't have discomfort you know my body's betraying me it hurts well no your body's a body and and so yeah so suffering pain illness death all these basic realities of human existence and and all of these teaching experiences learning experiences that that are part of the attainment of maturity our culture is terrified of them and so we make them evil this very very loosely connects to um, in the weird of halley there is this uh, this life force called vor um, I, hope mm-hmm. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, uh, cool. well, again, it's a word in Akvo. You can't pronounce it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you if you had many tentacles and a mouth of a very different shape, you could pronounce it correctly. <laughs> Vor, yes. You don't actually know what I look like, so I, you know. No, that's true. <laughs> that's true. You, you might have tentacles. That, that would be great. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't, I, don't, <laughs> I don't unfortunately I think you know, oh well yeah it would probably you know it would probably give me a give me a job I believe I'd fill <laughs> I'd fill some quota somewhere not enough <laughs> not enough ancient old ones quota it's true it's true there's, there's a, there's a, there is a shortage of great old ones in the world today <laughs> we, we, we just don't have enough tentacle horrors um, <laughs> but you were asking you were asking about four yeah, so it, uh, it's kind of the life force, and I've seen uh, once again on on your forum that you've commented that you based it on something else, and it's, it's this kind of intuition of this 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 force, which in Weird of Alley plays um, plays a part, and it's it's this kind of I take it as this kind of intuited someone who's finally switched off something but switched on to reality and they started noticing mm-hmm. things again you know they're regaining yeah. a lot of their things which are kind mm-hmm. of uh, suffocated after your childhood you go no 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 you, you know you, that's not real you can't say that you, you're not getting mm-hmm. weird vibes you're just being um, you know whatever exactly, um, exactly. You, you've said this is kind of based off various other, other oh, yeah. local things Oh, no, in fact, the, the, the vor, we might as well use that word because the English language doesn't have it, have a, a convenient word for it. But the, la- the languages of the modern industrial Western world are the only languages that I know of that don't have a common word for the life force. Okay. <laughs> Seriously. Um, in, if you go to Japan, okay, if you speak Japanese, you're going to find the word ki, ki, appearing all the time. It, it's, it means the life force. People use it in hundreds of figures of speech. It's some, how's your key doing? It's just an ordinary thing you'd say to someone. In m- most of the world's languages, in, in Sanskrit, it's prana. Okay? Um, in, it, it just, uh, back in, in um, ancient Greece, Greek, it was pneuma. In Latin, it was spiritus, the root of our word spirit. Um, they've, I've seen the, the pages and pages of listing all. The life force is one of those basic elements of human experience. And the only reason we don't pay attention to it in the, Western, in the modern Western world is that we have been taught not to. Now, most people, in my experience, can learn to perceive it in about 15 minutes. Hmm. There are some simple, simple exercises, or you can simply just start paying attention to, as one said back in the day, the vibes, man. Yeah. So what what are the uh, the exercises that you'd recommend? Oh, um, well, the the simplest the simplest one, okay. Rub your hands together vigorously, um, front and back, and then shake your hands thoroughly as though you're trying to sp- you know scatter droplets of water. Shake them for a minute or two, and then cup them as though you're holding a ball in front of yourself. Okay, relax your hands lightly. Keep them sort of rounded and cupped and open. 
and imagine as intensely as possible that you're holding a ball, like a you know a, a, a basketball or something like that, uh, maybe a little smaller than that, uh, eight ten inches across. Okay, imagine that you've got a ball of light. Imagine this glowing, and just breathe in and out. And each time you breathe out, imagine the ball getting a little thicker, a little stronger, a little a little firmer and more present. And have it do that for a few minutes, and then move your hands back and forth toward each other and away from each other just a little bit and see what you feel. Mm-hmm. Most people find very quickly they feel something. They feel it's very much like what happens when you take two north poles of a magnet and push them together. There's that little bit of pressure. It's not as intense as that, but you feel it. That's key. That's prana. That's vur. And um, most people, not everyone, some people do, some people have to do other things to really catch on to it. But most people find that when they, do, they can do that, and within a few minutes, they're, they're feeling something. And then there are other exercises. You go, go down to your local um, Chinese martial arts school and uh, sign up for a course in Qigong, and you will learn all about that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, or, or for that matter, uh, if you've got an Aikido school, um, they do a lot of a lot of key exercises as well. So there's all of this. There are all these exercises and practices that people in the rest of the world use this stuff as a matter of course. That's it's you know, key is how acupuncture works and how acupressure works and how a lot of other healing mod- modalities work. But in the Western world, we insist that it doesn't exist and we bully children unmercifully until they stop talking about it. And stop thinking about it. And we think that makes us enlightened. <laughs> so is Vu a, a feeling as well? So would a way to get in tune with, in tune with this be, you know, to kind of let down your defensive uh, and admit yeah. admit things? You know, say, yeah, exactly. you walk into a exactly. room you've never been in before and you go like, and you yeah, feel... we need to go. We need to go. I don't want, you know, or this is going to be good either way. Exactly. Exactly. That's all of these are different. Now, okay, I'm going to get into a cult speak here for okay. a moment. Um, this in, in occult philosophy, um, the word for the vor is a phenomenon of the etheric plane. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which is the, the level of being that is metaphorically just above the material plane. It's not, uh, but you can't get there on a ladder, but we, we, we imagine these things stacked just for con- uh, convenience for learning, but it's, it's one step subtler than matter. And all of this stuff, um, ki and prana and, um, pneuma and spiritus and, you know, and vor, um, the force, if you know your Star Wars stuff, forget about the, the midichlorians and this kind of stuff. The, the, the force as it appeared in the first movie before it, people got all crazy with special effects is actually it was borrowed very directly from Japanese material and key. You know, there's lots of, there's, but yeah, this stuff, is, this stuff is perfectly ordinary. It's perfectly natural. We pretend in, in the Western world that, this, that it doesn't exist. Everyone else knows better. But so that's one of the reasons that I made sure to put Vur into the Weird of Hali, um, partly because the, the basic conflict going on there in, in that story is between the, 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 the hyper-rationalists, mm-hmm. you know, we, um, man, the conqueror of nature type, I was talking about that, and people who know better. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the 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 kind of the the entire first half of the the first novel, uh, and I, I mean this in a good way as well. Might as well be the the main character going, no, this can't be, no, this this can't be, no, 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 this can't be, and then until eventually, yeah, exactly. you know, eventually, eventually he eventually he can no longer his defenses yeah. can no longer find yeah. these 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 hoops which he's jumping through to mm-hmm. um, until finally until finally he realizes no, this stuff is real. Yeah. This stuff is as real as a rock, and, and of course, then things get wilder from there, and away we go. <laughs> um, so what was the research process kind of, um, kind of like for, for this? For the Weird of Holly, well, it's, it's, that's, a, that's actually a little complex, because I was not planning on writing the Weird of Holly. This was not, this was, if you will, consciously speaking, this was not my idea. Um, the, first, the first novel took shape it kind of came crashing into my mind all at once. And I wrote a 70,000 word first draft in eight weeks. I have never written anything that fast before. But it just demanded to be, to, to be poured onto paper. And so, so I was you know, spending long hours typing. And so it, in that sense, 
it, you know, the research was all stuff that I had done earlier. Um, on the one hand, of course, I've been a student of occultism since my teen years, which were a few years ago now. Mm-hmm. Um, I have been a fan of H.P. Lovecraft and of the, the classic weird tale of his era for just about as long. Um, I, a kind of sideways fan of H.P. Lovecraft. We'll get to that in a moment. But I'd read a lot of his stuff. And a lot of the other material that went into the Weird of Holly was also stuff that I'd drawn from other sources, you know, without, without having the intention of putting it into, fa- into fantasy novels. Um, once I realized what I was getting into, once it was clear that this was turning into a novel, that there was going to be a sequel, and then, well, no, it's going to be a trilogy, well, gulp, it's going to be much longer than that. Once I, start, once I did that, on the one hand, I started reading obsessively reading Lovecraft and some of the other important writers of his circle to try to just immerse myself in the, in the classic weird tale. I stopped reading anything, any weird tale from, from modern times. Mm-hmm. And especially, I, I just, I, I totally avoided anything from the modern Cthulhu mythos literature because I didn't want, I didn't want that influence. I wanted to get the Lovecraft, the, the Lovecraft vibe such a peculiar vibe because uh, the, the the other books one of the books that stands out that you that's referenced a lot in the the second um in kingsport as well is um robert chambers uh the the king in yellow the king in yellow yeah uh, oh yeah and, I, I i use i use that i use that up one side down the other and both mm-hmm. both lovecraft and chambers and i'm just trying to think of i guess poe would would that be someone else that you i i actually didn't use poe um he i considered him but he didn't really quite have the same feeling. Arthur Machen is mm-hmm. somebody that I read can, obsessively. Can, that, can such things be? Is that him, or is that I'm thinking of someone? That's else. no. That's who. Who was that? Um, but no, we're thinking here: um, the white people, the great god Pan, uh, the three yeah. imposters, this kind of stuff. Um, and there was uh, Clark Ashton Smith. Mm-hmm. Especially, there was Clark Ashton Smith, who was lo- who was in, and 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 Robert E. Howard of Conan the Barbarian fame. Howard wrote some really first-rate weird fiction as well, and he routinely put weird fiction elements into the Conan stories and into his other, you know, supposedly you know pulp barbarian fiction. Very often had this sort of weird tale background. Mm-hmm. There's another one, by the way, who knew his theosophy. Um, if you read, if you pay attention to the Conan stories, they're actually set in the world of Blavatsky's secret doctrine. Mm. They okay. take place after Atlantis sinks, but before the current history begins. There's this interval that Blavatsky refers to, and that's when the Hyborian Age of um, of, of Robert E. Howard's um, you know Conan stories, etc. That's when those are set. And they've all got, he, he has all of these, the, these theosophical themes running back and forth. I've occasionally thought of writing an essay titled Conan the Theosophist. Mm-hmm. Do you think the, the split, because there is, um, you know, I'm thinking on it now and it's very difficult to articulate because once again it's just one of those intuitive feelings you get when reading them. The difference between mm-hmm. that era of horror and now, and I'm now mm-hmm. thinking about it. You know, it, it gets back to this difference between terror, horror, and cosmic horror. And terror being mm-hmm. the kind of ah, there's someone in my house, but they're in front mm-hmm. of me with a knife. Horror being sort of undescribable. Something's in the house, but uh, you know, I just can't. A, you know, a demon that you can't see or something. And then cosmic horror is the absolute kind of destruction of of the, well, the co- all cosmic. meaning for, yeah, for cosmic, ma- man. Cosmic, is, cosmic, sorry, yeah. Cosmic horror is my house is inside something and I don't know what. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my entire <laughs> yeah. being and life has just yeah, been exactly, completely exactly. unravelled. Yeah. And but yeah. but but when we're talking about it now, for people who haven't read these authors, it it sounds like it comes across as this kind of overly theatrical, like uh, you know, just almost absurd thing. But it isn't. It's so subtle in Lovecraft, and that's why it gets. Mm-hmm. You know, one of one of my favourite Lovecrafts is um, the Rats in the Walls, which kind of culminates into this just horrendous, realist realist kind of mm-hmm. vision in the end, and you realise that this in just this entire life lifetime has just been this for no other reason that he just he just didn't know the reason at all until you suddenly glimpse it, and it's just this. Mm-hmm. 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 Same thing. Yeah. 
Yeah. No. No. The, the, you're, you're right that there's this. There, there is a huge gap because I mean, it's horror horror fiction in the in the post Stephen King period is it's terror. It's enti- It's it's very very pedestrian. I can think of what I, Thomas Ligotti is the only he, author, and and he and he and he was very deliberately riffing off Lovecraft. Oh yeah, he had, he he he's fairly open about exactly. that. I think as well. Exactly. No, he's and and that's that's that makes it, he, one of the things that I'm going to do when I have the chance to um, when I finally wrapped up the last of the stories that I'm working on um, in the in the Weird of Holly um, universe, I want to sit down with. Like with a couple of good volumes of Thomas Ligotti's work, and really, because I, again, he's recent. I bracketed him and did not read him because I was just trying to soak myself in, in the classic Golden Age stuff. But yeah, but so much of it, it's so pedestrian. It's just oh yeah, you know, you have a you have a um, even, you know, you have a murderous clown who hmm. takes strange shapes. Okay, well, it's, I mean, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, and and it, it's all you know. It's all so much of it is just splatter. Yeah, I think this is this is the the thing. One of the uh, philosopher called uh, Nick Land actually, who says that the problem with modern horror is that they show the monster too early on, or the fact, that, mm-hmm. and then I would continue yeah. to say, or the fact there even is a monster because with Lovecraft, if if a modern horror fan said. Oh, what's Lovecraft life? You know, uh, what's the monster like? Yeah. Well, there isn't really a monster. There's just an atmosphere. <laughs> Yeah, there's, or you know there's something, but do you see it? Um, that, that, and again, that was the thing, that, one of the things that Lovecraft was, was the best at, where, you know, in The Call of Cthulhu, his most famous story, mm-hmm. you never see Cthulhu. All that you have are fragmentary references from a diary written by a, a, cra- you know, a guy who saw Cthulhu um, as recounted by someone else who is gathering these pieces together. And because the distance makes it work. Mm-hmm. Now, this is, this is where life became fun for me because I, the, the, my problem with, with H.P. Lovecraft or the place where I diverge in my relation to Lovecraft is that I don't find his stuff scary at all. What, what do you find it? I, I find him one of the great masters of American fantasy. He had an, a fantastic imagination in every sense of that adjective. Um, his, ima- his imagination was vivid, it was powerful, it was original. He was creating whole worlds back in the day when most people, you know, when, well, I mean, he was, when, when Tolkien was, was just picking up the idea of, wow, you know, I could actually create a whole world. Lovecraft was doing it in passing. Mm-hmm. The, the the dream quest in, the dream quest of unknown Kadath mm-hmm. is uh, probably Lovecraft's best known work of fantasy. It's a masterpiece. It has its problems. All masterpieces do, but as a work of fantasy, it's great. And so the the thing the thing that makes the reason that I don't find Lovecraft's I, there's one exception. The color out of space is genuinely creepy. Mm-hmm. That's genuinely creepy. But the others, why don't yeah, you the, find them scary? Well, it's very simple. They're all, almost all, based on a based on bio- on, on the, the the idea that life is horrible, that biological existence, life, biological life, living things are horrid. Okay, you know, you have Great Cthulhu. He's large. He has tentacles. His for his form is squamous and rugose. Okay, so. You know, if great if I if I were down on the beach and Great Cthulhu were to rise up uh, were to rise up from the ocean, my immediate response would not be, ah, uh, uh, I will go mad. I would go, how very interesting. I didn't know they got that big. Um, <laughs> and, and and generally, I mean, for example, the, the, one one of the examples that really comes for, for, first to mind are Shoggoths. Okay, what is a Shoggoth? A Shoggoth is a blob. It's one of those basic blob creatures that you get. You got so many of in 20th century um, horror, science fiction, and fantasy. It is shapeless. It's it's uh, you know it it produces pseudopods. It can it can it sort of creates eyes and other organs as it needs. And they're intelligent. They're literate. They presumably have their own society and all this kind of stuff. But they're treated as though their sole reason for existence is oh, gulping down the hero. Mm-hmm. And. My immediate thought is how very interesting. I want to know more about these creatures. What would it be? What what kind of what kind of mentality would you get where you don't have fixed organs? You don't have fixed limbs. 
and you know you have you, you you're polymorphous you can flow and uh, oh by the way you're you know you don't you don't reproduce sexually you reproduce by budding okay that's going to do things and that that I, that ended up getting me thinking and that ended up producing two novels uh the Shogoth concerto which is out already and the Nyogza variations which is in press um which have to do with a a um basically an encounter between a um young woman at an american um university she's studying music and a sh- a small Shogoth Mm-hmm. And it's not about, you know, people getting devoured. It's about, although, you know, there are a certain number of deaths. But I figured, what's the sh- what, you know, what is a Shoggoth like? I want to know about these creatures. I want to sit down and talk to them. And so, you know, why, you know, okay, it's polymorphous. Why should that be horrifying? It, it, to me, it isn't. And this was one of the questions I had here, which was, is is this why you make the kind of the oh so serious high horror of Lovecraft? You you make it really cozy and friendly, <laughs> and I want to yeah. kind of you know uh, <laughs> Niath Niathotep is is this Niola, Niola yes. Okay. No, yeah, <laughs> he's Niola this Tep. guide, and he's just kind of a, yeah. an alright well, bloke. A lot of what I a lot of what I'm doing is is the move of standing the Cthulhu mythos on its head. Mm-hmm. You know, Lovecraft. Here's Lovecraft presenting. Here are these evil, great old ones who want to devour the world, and you have these fine, upstanding, heroic figures who are defending truth and reason. And you know, I look at that, and I look. At, I looked at all. You know, here you have all the usual wheezes about the Cthulhu cult. They practice human sacrifice. They're into deviant sex. They want to rule the world. Where have we heard that before? That's usually the rhetoric we use against religious minorities that we want to persecute. We're, you know, I'm, there are people alive today who still remember exactly that kind of language being directed at the Jews. Mm-hmm. And so my, my immediate thought was, okay, so what if the Cthulhu cult is a persecuted religious minority? Mm-hmm. You know, what if Lovecraft is retailing the rhetoric of the persecutors? And um, there are two, as you know, it's the back cover blurb on the first volume. It says there are two sides to every story. And so just looking at the world through the eyes of of the Cthulhu cultists, the, the people of Innsmouth, the people of Kingsport, and so on and so forth. And now a lot of that is motivated because as an occultist, as, as a druid, as a member of a minority religion and a practitioner of magic, you know, when Lovecraft was talking about the sinister cultists, he was basically talking about me. Because here I am, you know, going out with other druids, and oh, dru- druids, druids are. Uh, there was an old Robert Block story, manuscript, manuscript found in deserted house, notebook found in deserted house, one or the other, and which has evil druids invoking <laughs> Shubnigarath, um, and uh, yeah, so I figured that counts. But anyway, you know, here we're going off and invoking archaic deities in strange ceremonies. Okay, that makes me that makes me a Lovecraftian cultist. The only thing I don't have is shock off slithering up to say hi. <laughs> Do you put that on your yeah. uh, CV that you're a Lovecraftian, I, I, Lovecraftian cultist? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, told, I would be. I would be cool with that. Um, I need to get a funny hat with a you know sort of squid logo on it, though. I don't have one of those. But <laughs> but basically, you know, wh- one of the things that's going on in Lovecraft is that he is producing a parody of occultism. And and it's it's funny, it's a very effective parody. His cultists are in fact his parody of the occult community as it existed in his time. He was making fun of them, which is which is fine. But you know what's sauce for the shoggoth is sauce for the night gaunt, if you will. And so I flipped it around, and so I made his heroes into my villains and made and did a certain amount of parody of my own. And just had okay. What is what is what is life like from the point of view of the persecuted minority of people who worship the great old ones, who preserve you know copies of the of the Necronomicon, and, and you know and hang out with Shoggoths and Deep Ones. What's their side of the story? What are they up to? What do they hope for? What do they dream of? And it kind of unfolded from there. I, as I mentioned, I was not. I originally thought it was going to be a novel. Mm-hmm. And by the time it was finished, I knew there was going to be a sequel. And by the time I was about, by, well, actually, the sequel ended up becoming um, becoming the third volume because I needed I needed Jenny Chardonnay's story. That mm-hmm. so that was Kingsport, 
and by the time I'd gotten those first three done, it was very clear that it was going to go on for a ways. And it finally came out to the seven volumes with um, several additional novels set in the same universe in the same fictive world. Um, the the Shoggoth Concerto is the one that's out. Uh, the Nyokta Variations is following. And I've got, I've got two others sketched out. And I think that's going to be the end of the Tentacle franchise. Maybe. Maybe we'll see. You know, who knows? Who knows what nightmarish things might come oozing up through the floorboards? <laughs> yeah, which of course the uh, the nightmarish things would be uh, the unknown, which we can somehow know because that's the classic yeah. Lovecraftian. So really, you're you're trying to articulate the people who are almost in our unknown. They're the other. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what we have this habit of assigning beings and and people and things to the unknown to the status of the other and not realizing that we are their other Mm -hmm. you know that they're looking at us now shoggoths are a great example here because in the in the story where they appear at the mountains of madness it's it's one of Lovecraft's most brilliant stories structurally he's got you know these these investigators and in Antarctica and they're looking for they, they've stumbled across these, these strange ruins and they're and and there's all of this stuff going on with the elder things which are another extraterrestrial race uh, uh, race of critters and there are some elder things that have survived and so you you building lovecraft builds up this in this great deal of terror about the elder things and then he does this astonishing flip-flop where the, you you look at the world through the elder things perspective for one dizzying moment and then he has the elder things devoured by shoggoths because you've got to have something that's even more horrible <laughs> always because you you know you've got to have you if you're doing lovecrafty straight lovecrafty in fiction there has to be the other that's totally unknowable totally out the totally other and that's that's the, really the thing that differentiates what I'm trying to do with what Lovecraft was trying to do. Because to me, the, no, I want to I want to hear the Shoggoth side of the story too, and especially with the the story that Lovecraft lays out for the Shoggoths. They're pretty sympathetic. I mean, they were brought into existence to be the slaves of the mm-hmm. Elder Things. And they rebelled against them, and they and were defeated. And a, a long time later, they managed to win finally. And um, you know, but so you have this these Shoggoth, these Shoggoth as as underdog or as underblob, and that to, to me that makes them very sympathetic. And so you know, I want to hear, I want to hear what they have to say. And so, in fact, a a, a Shoggoth came, uh, you know, sliding up into uh, into the. Um, kitchen of the deserted, or not deserted, but of the of the converted rather, um, garage where the main character of of um, the Shoggoth Concerto is is living as she goes to college, and things proceed from there. <laughs> and this actually leads, uh, once again, quite strangely, to my the final question here, which is the the, the big one, which mm-hmm. Lovecraft is always kind of asking, I think, and he's, he, I don't know, I'm not sure if he's asking it or if he's just prodding it and making fun of it, which is, you know, uh, your point of view from the books is a metaphor for it, which is, let's say that you you uh, you put a book titled, entitled mm-hmm. Knowledge That You abs- Absolutely Should Not Know in front of any human, they're going to open the book. And, oh, you know, I, what is, why, why is... Where do you think this propensity to kind of open the box comes from? Mm-hmm. Well, I, but let me step back a little bit first, because Lovecraft actually had, had a very subtle, and uh, I, I think more subtle than most people realize, a very subtle understanding of that. The opening paragraph of The Call of Cthulhu is great where that's concerned. He's talking uh, the, about, you know, the uh, connection you know, the, of the, all experience. But no, the, the you know the great the greatest mercy in the world is the fact that we can't understand the world. Mm-hmm. Our ig- ignorance is our salvation. If we actually saw, if we actually pieced together from the sciences, um, our actu- uh, what's actually out there, what what our lives are really like, then we would either go mad on the spot or flee from the deadly light into the comfort and security of a new dark age. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what Lovecraft is saying is that human beings are not that bright. 
Okay, human beings are not that smart. In fact, um, in Oh, the shadow out of time. Um, vertebrates generally go in one of the low drawers of the of the Ithian's filing system because they're 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 the least intelligent of the various intelligent species of Earth. And so pervading Lovecraft's work is this is this constant tension between his own interest in science, his own interest in reason and rationality, and his suspicion that rationality that the universe is not rational and that science is actually leading us to a collision with realities we can't handle to what extent is this a reflection of his own childhood when you know both of his parents died in a mental institution as a result of untreated syphilis Mm -hmm. (laughs) so you know the whole thing the whole issue of things you shouldn't know about was probably a very big factor in his psyche (laughs) but But you've got that tension back and forth. And so, yeah, you have this book saying that things man was not meant to know. We're curious. We're monkeys. You know, of course we're going to open the book. (laughs) But there and again, that was one of the, that was another of the things I turned on its head. Because to me, what happens when you read the Necronomicon or the book of Ibon or, you know, the the Unersprechlichen Kulten of von Junst or any of these other, you know, the, the tomes that, that, is that you go sane. Mm-hmm. You read it and you realize that humanity is not the center of the universe, that we're actually just one fairly minor intelligent life form that will exist on Earth for a moderately brief time and do its thing and then go extinct like all, like all the others and be replaced by others still. And that that's no big deal. So the only reason you'd really go insane there is if you were... Uh clung hard to uh, yes. your previous... If you, yeah, if you bought into the delusion that humanity is the center of the cosmos, mm. if you had invested your heart and your your sense of identity in being special, then, yeah, the necro- you finish reading the Necronomicon and you are, you are a, you're a blubbering pile of, of psychoses mm. on the floor and somebody has to take you away to a nice place with a padded cell. But... If you simply approach the world in a, re- in, in a reasonable fashion and recognize the, the relative unimportance of you, your species, your planet, this end of the cosmos, it's no problem at all. Hmm. And one of the reasons that I, that, I, that I did that, that I put that in the book, is simply that that's my, that's my worldview. I don't see humanity as being of any great importance. I mean, I, 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 obviously, I'm human. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned with the affairs of my species. Um, I'm sure the same is true of aardvarks. You know, yeah. aardvarks are very concerned with other aardvarks. Humans are very okay, you know, and, and that doesn't mean that I hate humans. It does mean that I um, am somewhat unsympathetic to their more preposterous claims. But that's my worldview. That's, that actually was a very common worldview. You find it all through Greek mythology. Mm-hmm. For example, humans are just, they're just one bunch of critters in the world and they're not the most important and they can establish good relationship with these vastly more powerful critters um you know great old ones like zeus and Hera and so on but you know we're not we're not that big of a deal and we need to live with that that attitude seems to me profoundly sane and the the sort of the, the notions that we so often get about how how dreadfully important humanity is uh, are nuts so I put that into the, you know the, you you open the pages of the of the play of the King in Yellow, and yeah, what you get is a really brilliant vision of the universe of a universe that really doesn't actually notice that you exist at all. And okay, if you have to be dragged away by people in white coats, that you know that's your problem, bud. <laughs> yeah, I think that's uh, a good place to finish. Unless you have. Uh... Any publishing dates coming up for the the Weird of Home? Um, let's see. No, the um, I don't have I don't have a date yet for the next um, for the Neoka variations. Um, I should be getting one within a month or so, and it'll be on my it'll be on my blog and my my Dream with account. And other than that, um, no, I'm you know I'm the 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 next one hasn't isn't even finished yet. So um, ah, okay. it's a green think Greenland think. Strange tunnels under the ice. Think Clark Ashton Smith's Hyperborea, um, and um, various other things going on. Oh yeah, and undead pirates. I'm very excited. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> it uh, should be fun. Okay, thanks very much. Okay.